Yeah, so uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Venkat Rama and Venkat uh, Gopalan, um, who is a professor of material science at Penn State University. Uh, known Penn, um, uh, Venkat for, uh, for many years. Um, and uh, we've learned a tremendous amount from him. He's given uh, um, several lectures um, um, uh, for physics, but and also for my group, and uh, I always learn a tremendous amount. And um, he's a great, um, great speaker. Um, so Venkat uh, got uh, his degree in, in uh, uh, metallurgical engineering uh, from IIT Chennai, uh, and then he uh, went to Cornell and got his PhD in material science. Um, and then uh, I guess I've forgotten this, but you you did a brief stint in Pittsburgh, um, working at CMU um, before joining the uh, before. Oh, you also went to Los Alamos, right? Right. Um, uh, and then uh, became an assistant professor in 1988 at Penn State, and has been there ever since. And uh, Venkat has had that. You know, uh, many uh, awards and um, fellowships, um, uh, including the, uh, the Career Award, um, but also uh, it's a NRC uh, Faculty Fellowship. Um, he's an APS uh, Fellow, um, and he's uh, also the currently group leader for the NSF MERSEC uh, Nanoscale Science. Um, and uh, he has also been on the editorial board for, of the annual, annual reviews of materials uh, research since uh, 2004. Um, so uh, uh, his interests, though, are very, very broad. Um, and um, he has a very restless uh, intellect and um, uh, loves to venture out in, in different areas and has been very interested in um, in symmetry, and I guess he got tired of symmetry, so he decided to talk about anti-symmetry, which is uh, <laughs> going to tell us about. Um, so thank you, Venkat, for uh, for joining us in this virtual uh, PQI seminar. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for your very generous uh, uh, comments there. Uh, I've known Jeremy for a long time. So I guess uh, you joined uh, you you pit in ninety eight as well, right? Or a little ninety six, but I don't know if we knew each other when you were here. Yeah, right, right. Um, and yeah, I and and in two thousand five, I I came there uh, at U Pitt and gave a talk at the physics colloquium, and the topic was similar. It was on symmetry. Uh, it was called distortion symmetry. Um, so um, I, I, I should say that I'm an experimentalist. Uh, I, I work in the area of linear and nonlinear optics, uh, uh, characterization of materials. Uh, I'm in the material science department here at Penn State. Uh, but uh, like Jeremy said, we use symmetry a lot in our research. And so that has become almost a, uh, an important big side project. So we, we have been publishing quite a bit in that area too, just group theory and symmetry. So today's talk is doesn't have experiments, okay? So I apologize for that ahead of time, but it is uh, it is all about symmetry and a couple of new ideas. So let me start sharing my screen. So that goes well. Um, so can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. Excellent. Um, so um, we recently, uh, Jeremy, you mentioned annual reviews. So I recently uh, finished my tenure, like I spent probably 15 years on that board. Uh, so finally I stepped down um, and uh, we were invited for one parting review article or group. And uh, so these are all the authors um, who have been working so they're not all necessarily in this review article. The, the, the uh, um, uh, reference for that is here. Let me see if I can get a laser pointer. There you go. So the reference, the reference is here. Um, but I've also been working with Danny Litwin at Penn State Berks. He is 85. He just retired because he said, okay, I can't teach online. It's COVID. 
uh, thing, you know, so he, it was a good time to retire. He is a brilliant uh, crystallographer and mathematician. I'm very, very fortunate to have uh, known, uh, to, to have been working with him all these years. Um, Ismail Adabo, uh, with whom I've been working for the last uh, four, five, four years. Um, and Jason was uh, one of his students, and he's also, I think, tuned in today. Hari, uh, who is, uh, uh, Hari and Jason wrote this uh, review article. Uh, he is also, I think, tuning in today. And um, uh, Brian is uh, 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 at Two Sigma as an analyst. Uh, Hirofumi is in Kyushu University. Um, and Vincent Liu is starting grad school in Berkeley, uh, just as we speak. All right, uh, there are a couple of other important references here, and I'm gonna talk about uh, anti-symmetry, and I'll just say in a second what that is. Uh, but a number of people here would know whether you're from material science or physics, that this is inversion, uh, inversion or spatial inversion, time reversal that is extremely important in, in especially in physics. Um, and these are well known. These are two very well known symmetries. Um, our group uh, over the years, all of these people have introduced uh, two new anti-symmetries. This is distortion reversal. And I talked about it earlier in 2015. And this is wedge reversion, which we recently introduced last year. And I'm, I'll, I'll focus my talk on this, um, but I'll briefly mention the others. Okay, so uh, let me just start with saying something uh, quite obvious. What is symmetry? Symmetry is doing something that looks like doing nothing. So that is, um, it sounds like a cute statement, but it's also quite mathematically rigorous. If you take an object and you're welcome to do whatever it is you want to do to it, except when I look away and look back at it, it should, I should not be able to tell you have done something. So within that very, very broad constraint, uh, anything you do to the object is a symmetry operation. Okay. As long as I can't tell the difference before and after. All right, um, so that's a very simple uh, example here of a square. I rotate it by 90 degrees. Rotations by 90 do not change. Uh, make, make it look the same. Um, the, if I mirror it about these diagonal mirrors, again, it looks the same. Uh, or the other set of uh, mirrors, horizontal and vertical mirrors. So if I put it all together, you call this a point group symmetry. Of course, group we mean in a mathematical sense that it is closed uh, under the, the symmetry operation, successive application of the symmetry operation it has an inverse, it's associative, and every element has an inverse and it has an identity. All right, so four refers to the four-fold rotation, which is two pi by four, 90 degrees. One set of mirrors, which is the light blue and the other one is dark blue. They belong to different classes. So this is an international notation for a point group symmetry. We call it point because at least one point doesn't move. And that is this point about which we were pivoting at this point. Okay. All right, so let's look at anti symmetry. <coughs> and anti symmetry is a black and white symmetry, um, which is uh, um, uh, so, so just look at this yin yang symbol, which is really well known uh, symbol, uh, especially in, the, in East Asia. And like, if we ask what the symmetry is, say, well, if I rotate it, well, that looks different. So that's clearly not a symmetry operation. So I have to do something more. And if I were to flip the two colors, that now looks the same as before. So what I had to do literally was I had to do a twofold, then a prime. And that prime uh, basically means uh, that I'm flipping two colors between black and white, and the swapping of the two colors is itself a symmetry operation. So this basic idea of color symmetry, this is a two color symmetry, but you can have many more colors and swapping or commute uh, or um, uh, uh, 
just permuting between different colors if you have more than two. Uh, that idea was introduced by Heesh very early and Shubnikov developed on it. And later on, Landau and Lifshitz in 1951 sort of gave uh, meaning, some physical meanings to these colors, in particular time reversal, which became extremely important. All right, so anti-symmetry operation switches between two states of a trait. Uh, and the trait here we are representing by two colors, black and white, but the traits could be time, position, path, charge, spin, chemical species, or what we are going to talk to say multi-vectors. So I have to define what multi-vectors are and why we should care about them. But they are basically switching between two states, positive and negative time, positive and negative space, uh, positive and negative path along any phase space, charge, spin, and so on. So distortion reversal is something we introduce, which just reverses a path, uh, going forward along some path versus going backwards. Okay, that was, uh, that we call distortion reversal that, in, I, and I gave a talk, as I said, in 2015. So if I have time, I'll present a slide or two at the very end, uh, just to jog uh, perhaps uh, the memory of those who might have attended that. Um, I want to talk about three others, time reversal, spatial inversion, and a third one called wedge reversion. The three together uh, will help us to classify all of physical properties in any dimension. And that's sort of a uh, crazy sounding claim, but we'll see if that works out. So if you think of any uh, physical property that you want to write down, um, uh, mathematically, and you want to say, well, what type of uh, uh, property that is, can we classify them into certain types based on symmetry? And, uh, and not just in 3D, but any dimension. All right, so let's get started on that. So spatial inversion is pretty straightforward. The space R goes to minus R. Here is a point of inversion. And um, and this, it is a self-inverse. That is, if you do it twice, you, it's like doing nothing. One basically means doing nothing uh, or rotating by 360 degrees. Um, and it commutes with rotations and mirrors, but it does not commute with translations. So when you say this is an anti-symmetry, it's switching between two states. Um, but uh, there are certain restrictions. It should be, the anti-symmetry should be self-inverse. And it should also commute with all the elements of the group with respect to which it is an anti-symmetry. So it's something is an anti-symmetry with respect to some group. So in this case, groups formed by rotations and mirrors are point groups. So it's an anti-symmetry when, uh, when you're concerned with point groups. But when you include translation that becomes space groups and it's not an anti-symmetry there. All right, and um, if you say, let's say you had polarization, it would flip the polarization if the material had uh, an inversion center. So there would be no net polarization if your material or crystal has point of inversion. All right, this is all sort of well-known stuff and please feel free to, to uh, interrupt. Um, if you consider spins, and I've drawn a classical spin here, you can think of, say current uh, uh, flowing in a loop, a flat loop, or a charge just moving around in a flat loop. Um, and the spin will not flip under inversion. A classical spin will certainly not invert, reverse under inversion. Now let's talk about time reversal. That is a lot more subtle. So you, I really encourage you, we spent a lot of time, especially Hari, who is on the call, in trying to figure out uh, all the subtleties related to time reversal. But at, the, in a very at a very classical level, it's very simple. The time flip sign, going forward in time versus going backward in time. So if you do time reversal one prime on time, it becomes minus two. And so if you had, for example, current flowing this way, current is, uh, 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 current density is a uh, charge per unit area per unit time. So if you flip time, it's gonna go the other way. 
Uh, and same thing with spin. Spin is some charge moving with some linear velocity along the loop. And that, that velocity can be flipped because it's distance over time. So you flip time, the spin is going to flip. So this is one flipping time to flipping time in order to flip spin, especially classical spins, was one of the key ideas of Landau and Lipschitz. And again, it's a self-inverse and it commutes with all of the operations. So it's good, it's an anti-symmetry. Uh, and if you had the symmetry, there would be no net spin. If you had time reversal, there'd be up and down, there would sort of, there'd be no net spin in the system. Now quantum mechanics, I'm not really going into this, but I really encourage you to read the, the review article. In quantum mechanics, where you have spin half particles, one has to be really careful because doing time reversal twice doesn't come back to doing nothing. It actually gives you minus one. Um, and that's because with these quantum mechanical spins, the, the time reversal is slightly de defined differently. The spins are actually defined by poly, poly matrices. And uh, you end up with an extra phase of pi. And that actually has physical implications like uh, Kramer's degeneracy or Abramov-Bohm effect and so on. So you have to be very careful with spin half particles, but often we can get away with the classical picture of spins. And this was very important for magnetic materials because you could, you could just do this, T going to minus T, uh, especially if you're considering expectation value of spin or magnetization, then you could treat it classically and you can forget about that phase. But whenever you do an experiment where that phase is important, you have to pay attention. So spin reversal and time reversal are often conflated, but um, only under certain conditions, especially if you're looking only at expectation values. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about the classical versus quantum, but let me move on to the basic idea of classifying different types of properties in various dimensions. So I'll start with three dimensions and say, I'll represent a scalar, for example, temperature or time with just a dot, okay? And, and Hlinka, it was not that long ago, in 2014, he had a paper in PRL called Eight Types of Vector-like Quantities. So literally, he classified vector-like quantities into eight types in, in three dimensions, okay? And um, you would have thought that was done, but I guess it was 2014 when it was done. Um, but you know you can think of say temperature or time as scalars or he called it neutral uh, polar uh, vectors which you can, he called polar such as polarizations or velocity and then there is the pseudo vector which physicists really love um, we, they call it pseudo vector but others might call it axial vectors and that's really a loop the real physical object is a loop but you use your right hand, you curl your fingers around it, then your thumb sticks out this way. And you pretend this is a vector. But as we notice, this object and this object behave very differently under symmetry operation. So this is really a, a loop. You have to always keep that in mind. And for example, curl of P polarization or spin, spin itself is one, of, one such object or angular momentum and so on. And finally, you may have something that's chiral, like a little slinky or some current flowing in a solenoid. And you would have some sort of pseudo scalar. He called it chiral. And these sorts of things you might call it, well, it's a scalar, but it involves a cross product. As you see, these things involve cross products, this, this pseudo vector. And if you dot it with something, uh, in this case, another vector, you get a pseudo scalar and in the pseudo scalar, uh, the pseudoscalar, again, transforms differently. So these are four types, and let's look at the symmetry operations that distinguish these four. So let's start with time reversal, okay? So time reversal is clear that all of those are time even. And by even, I mean that if you flip time, nothing is gonna happen, they remain the same. And odd means they flip sign. And later on, I'll also use the word mixed, which means it neither flips sign nor remains the same. It's something complicated happens. 
All right, so this is clearly time even, meaning the time is doing nothing, whereas the, the, the bottom row is time odd. Okay, so that's one classification. If I now look at spatial inversion we talked about, you can see that these, the axial and neutral vectors are inversion even, whereas the other uh, four are inversion odd, right? And um, let's look at one other thing. This is what Linka introduced in his PRL. Yeah. He introduced this mirror. He called it mirror prime, okay? And essentially what he's saying is think of some plane in 3D and think of putting all of these things, this dot, this axis, this pseudo axis, and this chiral axis, all of them onto this mirror plane and see how it acts on each of them. And it turns out that those guys are even with respect to mirroring with that. And the, the other two, or the other set of two are odd. Okay. All right, I don't expect you to remember all of that, but I'll summarize it in this table. So think about uh, on this side, action of that mirror prime, and here action of the spatial inversion. I've left out time for now, okay? And so it's either even or odd, even or odd, and there were four types of objects. The scalar is even to both, and the chiral object is odd to both this mirror and spatial inversion. Whereas a real vector, a polar vector, is odd to inversion and even to mirror, and the other one is odd to mirror and even to inversion, okay? And now each one of these quantities could be time even or time odd, so really there are eight types. These are the four, yeah, either time even or time odd makes one more copy of it. So that's it. So that's Linka's classification, okay? All right, so there is a little quick quiz on this. And well, I don't have, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to sort of not do the quiz. <laughs> um, so if you think about like two polarizations at different locations, you might think of some quantity like P at minus R minus P at R. So he, Linka calls it bi-directors. If you think about what it is, if you look at all of the sort of symmetry operations we talked about, inversion, mirror, and time, turns out it's neutral. It's like a scalar, okay? Although it involves vectors, they're pointing towards each other, they're at different locations. The, this quantity behaves like a neutral object. If you were to replace the polarization instead with spins, okay, spins remember are pseudo vectors, then it's, that could be, for example, an antiferromagnetic order parameter. Then that would be chiral by the symmetry classification that we just looked at. All right, so question is what is new, right? So this, this, is, this is Linka's study. And so the question is, uh, what, what, what else is uh, up about it? Um, and this classification turns out does not work for any dimension other than three. Okay. It's a very 3D centric classification. And there are two problems why, that may, why it is 3D centric. One is this whole use of axial vectors pretending you have used the right hand rule and sticking your thumb along this. It's a very 3D thing to do. Okay, I'll say something more about that. And the other is this mirror prime. It doesn't generalize well to a higher dimension. So we'll have to drop both of these things in order to make progress if we want to do a classification of to, or to any dimension. Okay. So let me say a few more words about the problem. So the problem with the axial vector is in 3D, as we noticed, we can curl our fingers here and we can stick our thumb this way and everything is well-defined. You can define a cross product and that's what axial vectors are. In 2D, you live on that plane. So there is no place to stick your thumb out, unfortunately. So there is no way for you to define a, a cross product in 2D. 
So you're stuck there just because cross product is not defined in 2D. Now, if you were to go to 4D, you have a problem of abundance. Now, for a plane like that, there are two normals because there are four dimensions here. Two of them are in this plane, two of them are sticking out. They're both normal to this. It may not look like that here, but you have to imagine that this is four dimensional space. There'd be two normals that are both 90 degrees to this, and you don't know which one to pick. And with five and six and seven, you have more and more normals. So you don't really know how to define the cross product there. So we, we just can't generalize beyond 3D. So you have to get rid of cross products. That's the number one thing that you have to do. The question is, what will you do in, in its position? Okay. I'll say uh, something about the second problem, then we'll propose a solution. The second problem is this whole mirror parallel business really depends not only on the object, but also on the ambient conditions it lives in, okay? So let me give you an example. Imagine one dimension, okay? So the question is, what is a mirror in one dimension? Well, a mirror in three dimensions is a two-dimensional plane. So a mirror in one dimension could be a zero-dimensional point. If you generalize a mirror that way, then a vector would be mirrored that way, and now if I try to bring those two into congruence with each other, I can slide them back and forth. I can't take the mirror image and overlap them. Just like your hands, your hands are chiral for that reason. I can't, and remembering that one side is white, the other side is darker. I can't really overlap them exactly on top of each other. So if I'm constrained to one dimension, even a vector is chiral, okay? Now, if I were to introduce a second dimension, okay, now I know I could take this vector and I could just turn, use the second dimension, flip it over and make these two overlap each other. So the vector is no longer chiral now in 2D, okay? But now if you think about a loop of current, say right-handed loop, you mirror it to a left-handed loop. Now I can keep moving them around all over the, sector two dimensions, I can't overlap them. So this 2D object is now chiral in 2D, right? So a spin would be chiral in 2D. Okay. Um, and now let's say you introduce a third dimension, one, two, and a third dimension. And now you have a mirror, which is a plane. And uh, now, you know, I can overlap both the vector with itself and the loop with itself. I can just flip it like a tortilla and left and right-handed loops can be overlapped. But now if I have a slinky, a right-handed screw and a left-handed screw are not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to overlap. Okay. So now this is chiral. Those two are not chiral. And if, you went, if I went to a four dimension, I can even overlap a left-handed and a right-handed screw. So that would be seriously a problem if we were to, if that were to happen, because we rely on the fact that, you know, the threading, the handedness of the threading to keep things together, right? All right, but this, what it tells you is this whole idea of mirror and then whether the objects overlap with themselves to define what, how, whether they are chiral or not, depends not only on the object, but on the dimension in which it lives. So you can't uniquely attribute this quality to the object itself because you're trying to classify these objects, not also object plus the dimension. And it's not going to, you know, it shouldn't be changing with every dimension. All right, so we have to get rid of this whole mirror prime business, but again, what should we replace it with? All right, so this is what we are going to do. Um, we are going to replace A cross B with A wedge B. And this is called the wedge product. Uh, many of you, I think a, a number of you are physicists, so you would know this quite well. I, I have maybe a couple of slides to explain it. <coughs> and you have to replace this mirror prime with something that uh, we introduced called wedge reversion or one dagger and I'm going to explain what this is. So I have to explain what wedge product is, and then I have to explain what this is, and then we'll come back to this classification, and that would be today's talk, I think. All right, um, so when 
we do these things, this is the domain of something called Clifford algebra. Um, a lot of you use Clifford algebra, especially the physicists, uh, although you may not call it sometimes, and many of you do. Um, but uh, most people don't know Clifford algebra. I certainly didn't until a couple of years ago. I had to learn this thing. <laughs> but it helped me to think about this problem. So I'll have to uh, maybe give you a very, very brief introduction to Clifford algebra because it's important for providing the, for explaining that concept. All right, so I'm going to try to be intuitive rather than very mathematically rigorous because that doesn't work always in a talk. So think about scalars, which are zero D, vectors, which are one D. Now I'm going to use two vectors and put head to tail, head to tail, I have a 2D object. I'm going to call it A wedge B. I'll define it in the next slide, okay? But think of A wedge B as geometrically, it's also called geometric algebra. Geometrically, think of this as a little piece of area, a little, uh, uh, a little slice of area with some sense of orientation like some circulation of vectors around the edges. Okay. So that's what a, an A wedge B is. Okay. And similarly, you can think of a tri vector. Now I am using three vectors and I will write it as A wedge B wedge C. And again, it is in, called an oriented volume. That is, I go boom, 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 boom. So I have some sense of circulation around this. It gives me some, uh, it's, it's called oriented. So it's a volume, but it's oriented. And similarly, I can go to quad vector. So now I have to go a four dimension. So, th so here I had three linearly independent vectors. Here now I have four linearly independent vectors, A, B, C, and you have to imagine this as a fourth dimension. So now this is a four dimensional object. And this volume here is a hyper volume in four dimension, A wedge B wedge C wedge C. So this is the hyper volume in 4D, this is volume in 3D, this is area in 2D, this is the length in 1D, this is just this value in 0D. Okay. And you can keep going. You can call it penta, call it, uh, make a penta vector, hexa vector, hepta vector, octa vector, and so on and so forth. If only we can, exactly define mathematically what this A wedge B is, but geometrically you're making these shapes, okay? And literally like pieces of puzzle that you're going to be putting and joining together. That's why it's also called geometric algebra. All right. Can so, I interrupt? Yeah, please, yeah. It looks like you have uh, a, a, a cycle of two sequences in each case. Yes. Is, is it always like that or could you have more? Could you have three? Um, in other words, I, I, let me understand your question. Uh, was that David? Yes. Uh, um, so you, you, you're thinking about the circulation, right? That yes. you have a left-handed circulation and then you could have a right-handed circulation, right? So that, I think the wedge reversion, that is exactly what it is going to do. It is going to reverse the sense of circulation. Well, I'm wondering if, if you, uh, in, in, in each case, like, like, like the A wedge B, hmm. you, you have the A vector, the B vector, yes. and then you have an A vector, B vector to close the loop. Mm -hmm. But could you have A, B, A, B, A, B and close the loop? A, B, A, B. Oh, I see. Can I include more than yeah. two of these yeah. to um, close the loop? I or does a linear in independence constrain that in some exactly. way? That I don't. Exactly. So A and B are linearly independent. So if I repeat it more than twice, then I'm sort of, it's redundant. Yeah, okay. okay. Because I can, I, I'm pretty sure I have to think about it, but I can take that shape and split it up into two parallelograms or something. Okay. or multiple parallelograms. Okay. So then it's just, I'm just adding them, adding these A wedge B elements and making bigger pieces. Okay. I, so unless fact, there I was might a have singularity an, or something. Okay. I, uh, later on, I think I have some sketches for that sort of thing. So maybe we'll, I'll keep that question in mind. All right, so um, let's, okay. 
Um, so this is a slightly technical slide because some of you will want to know what it is. So I have to say what it is. So if you were to say, what is A wedge, B wedge, blah, 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 blah. It's very simple. It's one by, if there were N of them, one by N factorial, and you take this determinant. All of these are A, all of these are B, all of these are C. It's an N by N matrix, and you take the determinant. But that leads to other problems. So immediately you say, oh, okay, well, if just A wedge B, I would take this determinant, like right there, A, B, A, B, and that would give me A, B minus B, A by two, okay? And uh, it also turns out the dot product is A, B plus B, A by two. So now you see this looks like cross product, but it's not. And this is dot product, and this is simply symmetric sum of the, this, this is A, B is called a geometric product of two vectors. So you have some, a symmetric sum of geometric products, anti-symmetric sum of geometric products, and both therefore give rise to the, the one of them gives rise to dot product and the other to the so-called cross product, but we call, we, it really is wedge product. So our problem now is we have some, some new, new uh, animal here, A, B. A is a vector, B is a vector. How do I multiply two vectors? I actually just writing them right next to each other. I know how to do dot product and cross product, but how do I just do A, B, right? So in Clifford algebra, that is the most fundamental concept that you can multiply two vectors just by writing them right next to each other. Okay, so let me say a few words about what AB is. Okay, so it follows another slightly technical slide. All right, I'm actually defining what algebra is right on the top because this geometric product literally comes up with a definition for algebra. I didn't really know this until I, I, I learned Clifford algebra uh, as to what a precise definition of algebra is, okay? But let me come back to the title in a second. We, we are stuck with this A wedge B is AB minus BA by two. But what is AB? How do I multiply A and B? A and B are two vectors, right? So here is how we would do it, okay? So think of three dimensions. Instead of calling it X, Y, and Z, I will associate each of these with square matrices. There's not any unique way of doing it, but here I'm using what are called Dirac matrices. Physicists would know this. You, many of you probably use it every day. So these are three of the Dirac matrices. And within them, they're actually four by four. Each of these is two by two, two by two. And each of these is poly matrix. Poly, sigma one is a poly matrix, which is simply zero, one, one, zero. Sigma three is one, zero, zero, minus one, and so on. And I is just identity one, one, right? So what am I doing? I'm really sort of pulling a trick here. I'm saying, well, my vector A is not going to be, is not going to be some sort of one, zero, zero, a three by one vector. It's going to be a four by four matrix. And, and it's gonna be square matrix. And therefore, if I have three linearly independent square matrices, and what do I mean by that? I, I have to, if I play with these four, these three matrices, I can confirm that if I multiply this matrix by itself, I would get identity. And if I multiply this matrix by itself, I would get identity, and same with this. So XX equals YY equals ZZ equals I, identity matrix. Similarly, the, uh, another beautiful thing about these Dirac matrices is xy is equal to negative of yx, or xy plus yx is zero matrix, okay? So xy and yx, they don't commute. Well, it makes sense because matrices, matrix multiplication doesn't always commute, right? So we cannot assume that xy is same as yx now that we are using matrices, okay? And so these three really, these three conditions, are essentially saying X, Y, and Z are orthogonal. And it goes back to Pythagoras theorem. But I, I, I'm going to sort of leave that alone and just, just say X dot, X dot X is one and X dot Y is zero. 
which we normally say that gets slightly changed when you use matrices. We say xx is identity and xy is negative of yx. Okay. And those, that basically captures the same orthonormality of these square matrices. Okay. So that's how I would multiply two vectors, A and B. I would write this in terms of matrices and that in terms of matrices and I'd multiply the two matrices. That's how it's just matrix multiplication. All right, so the beautiful thing now is starting from this vector space right here, three dimensional vector space. I say, oh, I picked these three matrices. How about I multiply them with each other and see what other new matrices I can generate that are also linearly independent. And it turns out I can generate five more. So I have now an eight dimensional space of matrices. X, Y has its own matrix. I didn't write them down. X, Y, Z, you take all three of them and multiply. I get a matrix and so on and so forth. Now suddenly a three dimensional vector space turned into eight dimensional algebra. Okay, and so we have moved from, and that's where this title comes from, a vector space is closed under vector multiplication. So if you multiply two vectors, the result must also be in that space. And the only way that can happen here is if you consider this whole eight dimensional space, then this is closed under vector multiplication. Okay. So in general, uh, if you have n dimensional vector space, you can expand it by this using these matrices to two to the power n dimensional Clifford algebra. Okay. So if you use these conditions, it's called Clifford algebra. If you, um, in general, uh, you know, the, if the matrices don't have to follow this, it would be an algebra in general. Okay. So a vector algebra is really, uh, or an algebra is just a vector space closed under vector multiplication. All right, um, so that's what a Clifford algebra is. I'll show you how it expands to various dimensions because it's useful for our classification. So we just looked at this 3D becoming 8D, but you can do this and whatever vector lives in this space, it will have some component along each of these axes. Now this is considered an axis. This is considered a uh, scalar axis. All the scalars numbers live along here. All the vectors live in this red subspace. All the bi vectors, little patches of area live in this blue subspace and all the tri vectors live in this, this green subspace, okay? And so if you have a general multi-vector, this word multi-vector comes in, it lives in the space, it has eight components in general. So whatever lives in the space, Clifford algebra space is called a multi-vector, okay? So, it's a, so you can do this for any dimension. So we just did this for 3D, which is right here. It has one scalar, three vectors, three bi vectors and one tri vector. So three vectors, three bi vectors and one tri vector. And for zero D there's one scalar. This is Pascal's triangle basically, okay? And every algebra you might know of is actually a Clifford algebra. You might not know it. For example, the real number algebra is just a zero dimensional Clifford algebra. A uh, vector algebra is just in any dimension is just those guys that, that are circled there. A uh, complex algebra in 2D is just that. A quaternion algebra is just that. So every algebra and octonians are also in here. So most of the commonly known algebras are subalgebras of Clifford algebra. Okay. So if you know this, this is the mother of most of the things we do. All right, so I think it's time to go back to our, uh, um, uh, I guess we lost some time in the introduction, so I have to speed up a little bit. Um, so go back to our classification and let's see if we can finish this. Um, so a little patch of area, uh, say X and Y, we would normally cross, call it the cross product by sticking the thumb along it but now we are going to get rid of it. We are doing, going to just call this one X wedge Y, and this is a wedge product, okay? So this itself is its own object. 
And by using the previous rules in the previous slide, you can see x wedge y is actually just x y. It's basically like multiplying x and y units of this. Okay, so here is some geometric way of thinking about this, and that goes back, uh, David, to your your question. So, for example, a little unit area here would be one along this bi vector axis. This itself is an axis now. X wedge y or x y is a vector is an axis. So one along that is uh, is a bi vector. Now, if I were to flip x y y x the circulation goes from clockwise, counterclockwise to clockwise, okay? So that would be the difference between x wedge y and y wedge x. If I were to take four of them, let's four of these and put them together, all the inside vectors will disappear and you have a bigger area with an outside circulation. That's just four of those. So it just nicely turns into four in, in that, along that axis. And similarly, you can make eight along that axis and so on and so forth, okay? So literally you're using these things as pieces of puzzle and you're attaching them and the inside vectors get canceled out, okay? All right, um, I think I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, let me jump to uh, what is wedge reversion because that is the key idea to generalize all these multi-vectors, we are gonna write properties as multi-vectors and I'll show you that there are only 41 types in any dimension. All right, so wedge reversion does the following. We are introducing this as an anti-symmetry. So it's a scalar just goes to scalar. It doesn't do anything to it. A vector just stays vector. It doesn't do anything to it. A bi-vector, it, it goes from a clockwise circulation to a counterclockwise circulation. So in other words, V1 wedge V2 becomes V2 wedge V1. So literally I sort of mirror it. Whatever is this way, you know, I just mirror it. I go, I, I go back, front goes back and back goes front, okay? A tri-vector, I do the same thing. One wedge two wedge three becomes three wedge two wedge one. And that'll again flip the sense of circulation of vector from clockwise here to counterclockwise here. Okay. And it'll it goes on like that. It goes on for higher dimensions. So if I had V1 wedge 2 wedge 3 wedge 4, this one 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 dagger will flip it to 4 wedge 3 wedge 2 wedge 1. Okay. It'll flip the order. It's uh, in Clifford algebra, this, this operation already existed. It, it is called reverse. Um, and so we are just giving it the status of an anti-symmetry. We are calling it wedge reversion and, and using it to classify vectors, okay? So it's a very simple thing. These are oriented objects. We are going to simply swap the order in which the, those, ve those wedge products occur from front to back to back to front. Sometimes it'll switch the sense of, uh, it's a switch the sign of that, that object. Sometimes it won't, okay? So that's, that's interesting based on, on, uh, on, on how the math works out. All right, so the, the new anti-symmetry, it's even, even, and these two are odd. That is, it flips these two, but it doesn't flip these two. And so it's starting to behave a lot like the mirror parallel that we were trying to discard, which is basically that does the same thing. Okay. All right, so we are back to our classification. And remember, uh, we used mirror parallel and inversion, and we had this, this, the four things were fitting in here, but this was very 3D centric. We are going to get rid of the mirror, and we are going to use this one dagger. Okay, and the classification is still good. Okay, in 3D, the classification is still good based on the previous slide, okay? But what you get in addition is now I can go to any other dimension because this one dagger now is defined for the object uniquely in any dimension, okay? So for example, if I go, the, the, the scalar is called uh, zero grade, uh, uh, object or zero grade blade, actually these are sort of terminologies in, in Clifford algebra. This is called first one grade, two grade, three grade, tri-vector is three grade. 
then if you keep going, the quad vector is here, penta vector is here, hexa vector is here, hepta vector is here. If you keep going, octa, nona, deca, ten deca, then do deca, and so on and so forth. So it goes in units of four, it keeps populating this classification. Um, and it can go on to any dimension. Okay? So what we gained by defining something like wedge reversion instead of that mirror is that we can generalize it to any dimension now. All right. So we using that, let me just give you a few examples and then my talk is done. Um, so here is our eight types of vectors that Linka would have said, uh, would have mentioned, but they're slightly different here. Now I'm using three operations, inversion, time reversal, and wedge. And it's either even with respect to that or it's odd O with respect to the, that operation. So E and O are even and odd. So for example, the bottom five to eight are time odd and one to four are time even, okay? And all three of these could be even, 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 or odd, 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 or even, odd, even. And there are eight possibilities. And therefore there are eight types of principal vectors when you include, when you consider three anti-symmetries, okay? So now you have three anti-symmetries. There are eight possible ways in which things can be even or odd. Those are eight types of what we call principal vectors, okay? principal vectors. And here are some examples of that with polarization, position, electric field, wedge product. Uh, it's like the del cross P, but it's not, it's a bivector. Or magnetic field, spins. The star is something called hot dual because you're turning a spin into a bivector rather than, a, than keeping it a vector. Okay, I'll give some more examples later on, but there, we have basically recovered eight types, okay? But we can do more now that you, you, are, in, you are in multiple dimensions. Uh, these are some uh, terminologies I introduced, which are in this column. It's not so important for this talk. All right, um, so this is what you can do. In Clifford algebra, you can do very weird things. Remember that multi-vector can live in that eight dimensional space. So it could have a little p. So here is some weird combination. It could have a scalar plus two times a vector, some vector, minus five times a little piece of area, plus 23 times some little piece of volume, plus 12.8 times little piece of four dimensional hypervolume and so on, okay? So you can make up you can add different things, like different types of things. For example, you can add vector and vector in conventional vector algebra, right? You can't add a vector and an area and a volume. But in Clifford algebra, there's nothing stopping you. It's an eight dimensional space. You can add them together. And uh, it's no different than making a fruit salad, okay? So you, you're like, how am I going to, you know, it's apples and oranges. Well, you can always make a fruit salad out of apples and oranges. And that's what Clifford algebra does. It just makes a fruit salad, okay? And it works. All right. Um, so if you're willing to make fruit salad, let me just back up here. There are actually eight ingredients here, eight principal types of vectors. I could take, a various bunch of these and add them together. And I could make different types of fruit salads with eight ingredients. And if I do that, let me just click ahead. I can get 33 more types of salads. So overall eight original ones and 33 more fruit salads, I get 41 types, 41 types. And those are it, in other words, those are the 41 types that of multi-vectors that can exist or the categories. Um, it, it, let me rephrase that. All of the multi-vectors in any dimension, this is not restricted to 3D or 4D or anything. All of these multi-vectors in any dimension, if you use these three anti-symmetries, can only be in one of 41 types, can be only one of 41 types. 
And so if you are able to express physical properties in the language of multivectors, then any property that you can measure in any spatial dimension will have to be one of these 41 types. Okay. That's, that's sort of the key thing. And, and I said spatial there, but to tell you the truth, you can also bring time, yeah, 4D space time can also be dealt with nicely in Clifford algebra and it is done, you know, people do do that. All right, I'm, this, is, uh, um, this is gonna be my uh, last slide, I think. Um, so um, I, I, I'm giving some examples of these fruit salads, okay? So for example, position in, you could take time and add to space. Space is a vector, time is scalar, but you could add it in Clifford algebra to make this. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the space time thing where you have four currents and four charge and four potentials and four fields and so on. And so here you have a position vector. So it's really the language here I'm using is 3D plus one. So space plus time. And uh, the, the, the important thing to note is you see the M, M means mixed. So the inversion neither flips it nor leaves it alone. It changes it, but it doesn't switch the sign. So M is for mixed. This is the time reversal also leaves it mixed, but the, the, the one dagger, it's even with respect to that. So it has this unique signature M, M, E, but it needs one more piece. It needs something called stabilizer subgroup. That is this operation would not do anything to it. One dagger, for example, doesn't do anything to this vector. So here there's a bit of redundancy. You're saying one dagger is even and one dagger doesn't do anything. But uh, I'll show you a few more examples where these two can be different. So with these four fingerprints, this thing belongs to one of those 41 types, okay? Here is the derivatives in space and 3D space in one time. Again, it is exactly similar to the position. Here is four currents. You can mix charge and current density, the scalar and a vector and see this is different. And here, uh, the operations that leave this four current alone, doesn't do anything to it, is of course one dagger, which is here, but also one bar prime. See one bar kind of leaves it mixed, one prime kind of leaves it mixed, but one bar prime will leave it even. Okay, so it's actually even with respect to one bar prime and it's even with respect to one dagger. So you need these four fingerprints using these three anti-symmetries to uniquely identify what type it is. So let me just click through the others, electromagnetic field, Maxwell's equations, wave equation for electric field, wave equation for magnetic field, charge conservation, electromagnetic density, pointing vector. So I, I was obsessing over EM, I'm an optics guy, so I, I picked on EM, but um, yeah, so these are some of the different types of those 41, 41 types of multivectors. Okay. Here are some physical quantities that would be like, you can identify that with, hey, this is this type of multivector and, and so on and so forth, okay? And the important thing is there are only 41 such types in any arbitrary dimension. Um, I was going to say something about d distortion reversal, but I'm going to leave it because it's, uh, I'm over time. And uh, all I would say is if you read the review article, we also introduced a concept called distortion reversal. And uh, here are some of the papers down here that I'd like you to take a look. And they are actually very useful in, in, in finding minimum energy pathways, for example, oxygen moving across graphene, would it go straight across or would it go around a chain? It turns out it would be go around the chain with it'll, it'll have lower energy barriers. And you can do this, uh, Jason Munro, who is uh, tuned into this uh, call has even written a code that works with uh, uh, you know, various codes, the nudged elastic band codes uh, that are available with VASP and, and, and other DFT codes. Um, so it, it's available on GitHub and um, you can also read the review article. 
So I'll leave the conclusion slide. Uh, and, and basically, we talked about anti-symmetries, time reversal, inversion, wedge reversion, which we spent most of our time on, and uh, distortion reversal, which is reviewed, but I didn't really talk about it. Um, and so here, I, I'll just uh, leave the conclusions there and, um, and uh, turn it over to Jeremy for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, yeah, it's really fascinating talk. Uh, I have questions, but I'm gonna wait and let's see uh, if there's something in the chat or I think people can just chime in with questions. So uh, while people are thinking about their questions, um, so um, I, uh, yeah, I, I remember learning not about the Clifford algebra, but about you know wedge products and so forth when I was uh, a freshman in college. And it said, oh, don't use cross product. This is like the not the right way to do it. It doesn't generalize to higher dimensions. Um, and uh, then I, you know, I ended up using, you know, cross products later on. And, <laughs> and I, I guess the, the question I have is, of course, I, you know, I think from a mathematical point of view, it's cleaner, it's the, maybe it's the right way to think about it. Can you give an example of something which is like, you know, much higher dimension where all of this is relevant to, to physics or to, you know, something because I mean all, all the examples that you were giving were you know three three plus one and so the question yeah. is like in 13 dimensions what is the you know what is the problem where the 13 dimensional um you know uh, uh, in, instance of this would would be relevant um uh, so I have no idea what happens in 13 dimensions <laughs> so to, just to make that clear um, but, um, you know, I, I, I heard that for, I'm not a physicist, so I, I'm actually interested in some of these things. For example, string theory, I believe, is in 10 dimensions. I'm pretty sure that some of this language would be extremely useful there. But uh, let me just point out something that you just said. For example, you said, uh, this is 3D plus one. I, I agree. I wrote it as 3D plus one instead of a 4D. And the only reason I did that is because uh, it was more pedagogical, but I can do all of these things in real 4D, where time is also treated and then you have to consider Lorentz transformation, like honest to goodness four dimensions. And all of the physical quantities that you are involved in, four current, four, four uh, potential, and uh, you know, space time, uh, all of these things, they will, they, these, they will all be classified. They can all be classified as one of these forty-one types of multivectors. So, okay. in fact, in in that four D, all of these, like this Maxwell's equation right here, it would look much simpler. In fact, it won't be like dou t plus del f equal j. It will be like uh, del f equal j. And that del is uh, truly not 3D plus one, it's a 4D derivative, space, 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 space time derivative. Yeah, that's why I said like seven, not four, but yeah. So um, let, let, me, let me let Steve uh, ask a question. Steve Halberg, he has his hand up. Okay. Um, hi, thanks. Um, so I wanted to ask about your last example, the um, diffusion of oxygen on graphene. It's just a nice concrete example. So how does your approach help to determine, you know, um, which is the lower energy path. Yeah, that's a, you know, so you really want to know more about this, this, this thing. So um, I would probably need slides to explain that, but let me give it a shot. Uh, also, I think Jason Munro is here who did some of these calculations. So there, he, he would be also welcome to speak. Okay, uh, Jason, how about I go at it first and then if you want, you can add something to it, okay? Sure, sure. All right, so uh, what, uh, so let me just say what this distortion symmetry is because you asked. Um, so what it is, is let's imagine you have some set of atoms or points in space 
and let's say that they all you do something to it and it, it they move like this red atom moved to that think position and this moved there and that moved there and so you could map we call it a distortion and we map these with a vector field each one of these is a unit vector u and what this wedge uh, distortion reversal does is it takes all of these vectors and flips their sign instead of this atom going to the right, it would go exact opposite direction to the left. And uh, instead of this going up, this would be going down and so on. So it's a very, very simple basic idea. It's like if you imagine all of these atoms are following a path, like moving slowly from here to here, it would reverse the path and it would go the other way. Okay? So that's why you could also call it maybe path reversal. We call it distortion reversal. All right, so how does that help in, for example, that diffusion problem? So in general, in physical sciences, one of the important problems is that of finding minimum energy pathways. So for example, what is the minimum path, path that will give you the minimum barrier to go from say this well to that well? And it turns out, well, there is a path, it's called the MEP, minimum energy path. And so typically, let me just say how people find it. So usually you would not know the energy landscape of the material. For example, this graphene problem. You would not necessarily, you know, it's computationally very expensive to map out this entire thing. This is just an example. So all you might know is you might know this endpoint and you might know I want to get there, but you won't know what is in between. So literally, you don't know that you, you want to go from here to Boston, but you don't know any, you don't have Google Maps or anything, right? So you just have to throw a, a, a lasso on the, and figure out, you know, which way and wiggle it. So literally, that's what it does. It throws a lasso across. And then the question is, you know, you, you move it around, usually with this nudged elastic band method, you move it around until it, falls to a point where you further wriggling it around. And usually this is done stochastically. Nothing else happens. So you say, oh, okay, I think I've reached a position which is minimum energy path. Okay. So it's sort of a random way of throwing a rope and wiggling it with just pure noise. Okay. What the symmetry thing does is it allows you a much more systematic way once you throw a rope to, there are only a certain number of ways in which that rope can be wiggled. And that comes straight out of group theory. If you take this, uh, this, um, so let me click here. So supposing I am going, this grab, this oxygen was going straight across, then I can take this and I can assign this path. So instead of usually you give a symmetry uh, group, attribution to a structure, right? A static structure like a crystal. But here you're going to give a symmetry group attribution to an entire path. And so here is a path and, and here is the symmetry group, M star, M two star. So it's just like any other group. It's like an MM two or it's like, you know, it's analogous to a magnetic group, for example. So it completely has all the information about this path, okay? So your symmetry encoding information about this path. And now that I know my rope has this symmetry, I know there are only so many ways in which I can break this symmetry or break, break, you know, wiggle this, this, this rope. So for example, I could break this mirror or I could break this mirror or I could make this twofold. So there are three ways. So instead of infinitely randomly trying various bunch of stuff and, you know, and even if you get an answer, you don't know if you just waited long enough, you might get some other answer. You know, sometimes it's numerically, you don't want to wait forever. So here it tells you there are only three ways of wiggling it. And if you wiggle it, it turns out that only one of those, one, one of those three ways leads to a lower energy pathway. So in this case, if I break this one and this one and leave only this mirror, so then that would be a path like this. You can literally see it has some sort of mirror symmetry here, right? Okay. And 
that turns out when you do the nudge elastic band ha to have a lower symmetry. So literally, you know, what, what this uh, method does is it gives you symmetry tools to start with some path and to systematically break down symmetry until you have no symmetry left. And hopefully by the time you come down to the top, uh, to the bottom, you have explored all the possibilities with that initial path. Um, Jason, did I, did I miss something? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Okay. So it's a symmetry tool in order to, to, to find something that's done stochastically today. So that, that's, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a quantum question. Actually, the, yeah, the spin one half is very interesting, uh, what you mentioned. Um, uh, the, I guess a question I was gonna ask was, <laughs> you know, if think about uh, like ordinary Hamiltonians, um, they generally have a, a certain like scalar symmetry to them. And so you can put together terms together, you multiply can terms in certain ways. And in, uh, in some sense, these products are, um, can have um, this, the, the types of symmetries that, that, uh, that you described. And then there's a restriction on the types of uh, final ways in which terms can be multiplied together to give you allowable um, how, uh, Hamiltonians and interactions. And I guess that in, um, in some cases for, for driven uh, non-time independent systems, um, you can even have, you know, more complicated things like time crystals. Have, have you thought about how um, the symmetry uh, concepts would relate to the, um, either the, you know, the, the class of sort of time independent Hamiltonians or the ones where they're driven like that give rise to time crystals. And, repeat, yeah. and there's a lot of work at Penn State that's uh, in, involved in uh, developing, mm -hmm. uh, I think in physics department, but, uh, mm -hmm. but um, I was wondering if you had um, thought about this. Yeah, um, I haven't worked on time crystals to tell you the truth. Um, uh, the question is whether we have something new to say using the symmetry arguments about that, right? So that I think is your, the essence of your question, right? Um, let me say, think. Do we have something new in terms of just uh, modulating time? Um, actually, we did give this some thought and we actually listed a whole bunch of groups that were time periodic. This, <laughs> thank you for reminding me this. Um, and in fact, Hari and Jason did that and we published a couple of papers. I, I would probably like to turn that over to Hari. Hari, are you there? And do you want to say something about that? Um, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, so it turns out that uh, the concept of colored symmetry that we get introduced in one of the first slides, right, is anti-symmetry, the black and white symmetry. Um, but if you extend this idea to um, other, you know, to multiple colors, like say you have three colors and it's a permutation, right, um, instead of just black and white, um, the groups that you derive from, uh, from that can be used to um, figure out the symmetry of time crystals in a classical sense. So we're not looking at anything quantum here, um, but those, you know, those colored groups uh, can be used uh, to describe the symmetries of time crystals. Yeah, and you, you wanted to know something about quantum aspect of time reversal, Jeremy? Is uh, well, I mean, there definitely are. Yeah, you can you can have driven systems where you explicitly break time reversal symmetry, or uh, some subcomponent, you know, uh, breaks time reversal symmetry. Um, yeah, I just it, it seemed to me as though that there is maybe either room for application, um, even if the you know the formalism isn't necessarily generalized. It just uh, seem to me that there might be some uh, some room for uh, exploring the consequences of the categorization that you've worked out. 
So there, there, there is, um, there are some applications that we kind of outlined in these papers, and one of them is in deriving selection rules for um, higher harmonic generation processes and these materials. Because um, you can again, if you if you if you're driving a system really hard, you know, like a strong optical pulse, for instance, it becomes a time periodic system. You can no longer ignore the uh, time dependent potential. So in that case, to actually derive the selection rules for different harmonics, you do need to consider the time dependent symmetry. And so these, um, you know, knowing the the spatio temporal symmetry of the system. Um, would be important in that context. Great. Can I follow up on that? Please. Um, I was curious, you know, as I was watching this, it remind these multi vectors reminded me a lot of things I learned about, you know, de decomposing tensors into their irreducible components, right? And, some parts are scalar-like, other parts are linear vector-like. Uh, and, you know, you've got, when you're doing nonlinear optics, right, you, you've got these response functions, right, which you typically describe by some sort of tensorial product. But if you get to really high fields, I, I, I mean, you know, when things like the index be, become a complicated function of intensity, et cetera, is this approach still usable or does it break break down, right? Because you, you get to something really quite different, right? You, you're starting off with maybe a, a material and a field that's a perturbation, but you evolve to the case where maybe the field is the dominant thing, right? And the lo 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 local atomic nu nuclei, nuclear charges and things are the perturbation. Right, and you have to go through that transition in some way. Does this symmetry approach allow you to actually treat things across that tra transition from you know weak 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 field to to strong field dominated yeah. field? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't see a fundamental reason why not, um, because you know what you call a perturbation is just naming it right. Yeah. Because you can always take a material with a field and find the symmetry of that. You know, it's not just the symmetry of the crystal, but it's the symmetry of the crystal with the field. And um, so... Uh, but, but, if, but if you have internal energy states that can be populated and excited, mm -hmm. but you, you could incorporate that in a natural way. You think. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay. So, you know, this, this symmetry is just a, a, a mathematical formalism to capture some particular moment there uh, of, of the material's response under some driving force. So I don't necessarily see it breaking down anywhere. Um, the question is, you know, if you say, oh, uh, there is a, if, if you include time, then that's good. If you're only talking about equilibrium processes and things are happening at crazy fast speeds, then the question is, okay, the symmetry itself is changing. At what point uh -huh. do you say, like I have a hexagonal crystal and I slightly distort it, it's still hexagonal, although I'm kind of distorting this thing, but the strain is small versus at some point I've, done such a job with the bonds that the symmetry is different of the crystal. It's no longer hexagonal, it's monoclinic or something. So that is a, a simpler example of what you're saying, where the perturbation is, it, it's no longer a perturbation to the symmetry, the symmetry group itself has changed. Yeah. Um, Hari, did, did you capture uh, other aspects of that question? That, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, uh, just just that this this idea of needing to consider the time periodicity of the Hamiltonian becomes important only when the fields, dr the driving fields, are strong, right? And so that is actually the limit in which we looked at this um, higher harmonic generation selection rule thing using spatiotemporal groups. Um, in general, though, you know, when we're doing nonlinear optics, we just look at the static symmetry of the crystal, and that's sufficient. 
so yeah, so these are, I guess these are the two um, limits. Um, okay, I don't see any other hands or questions. So maybe uh, we'll thank uh, Venkat again for a uh, really uh, fascinating, thought-provoking seminar. Um, it's great to have you uh, virtually. Wish we could have you here in person. Sure. But, uh, yeah, in a year, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or maybe, maybe before November. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> November 2nd, I heard. Yeah, <laughs> heard some rumors on Twitter. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thanks again. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's truly an honor. And thank you for your time. And thanks, everybody, for your questions and staying till the end. Appreciate it.